Hello and welcome back to Explainiacs. I'm Lindley Gooden, reformed journalist and curious human. Now this time we're talking engagement. Oh, would you marry me? <laughs> no. No, 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 not that kind. The talking, ideas generating, happy workplace kind of engagement. Let's face it, despite all of the challenges that the early 2020s have thrown at all of us, one thing has stood out despite our separation, a glimpse of humanity in business. And some have managed to keep their relationships alive across time zones, screen to screen, separated only by distance through genuine human engagement. It's probably one of the most overused words in business, but that's the name of the game this time. Luckily, I know an expert who's worked at the front line since the mid 2000s. He's an internal communications, change and engagement specialist, working with the likes of IKEA, the National Grid, Transport for London and Deloitte too. His name is Simon Munger. Hello, Simon. Hello, thank you very much for having me. Lovely to see you, great to have you with us. So let's just throw a small definition out into the world to get us started. New subject. Internal communication is about the way a company or an organization communicates to employees. The tools, the tricks, the tactics change, but ultimately, if you can get your team to pull together and achieve something special because you've engaged them, then you are an internal communications genius. And tens of thousands of people every year go into internal communications with the same goal in mind. Please translate. Engagement drives business performance in a number of ways. Firstly, through greater productivity, a better customer experience, and lastly, that you're more likely to retain people. So Simon, let's try to define engagement. What on earth is engagement for you? It's a really tough one for a lot of people, and I think that's part of the problem. But um, basically, the example I use a lot is there was a photo that I saw of an unfortunate hedgehog that had been squashed by the side of the road and he, it had double yellow lines painted across it. The thing about that really, and the way the thing that sums up for me what lack of engagement is, if you have someone who's really engaged in their job, really understands why it's important, that person going out painting lines on the road would have stopped, removed the unfortunate now deceased hedgehog yeah. uh, and then painted the line. Mm. But this is a person who clearly was so disinterested, they just painted over it and carried on because they didn't feel that it mattered. Yeah. Now, we've all had examples where you've worked with people where it's clicked, it's really worked well, yeah. you feel like there's speed and drive. Um, and I think that is the main thing that kind of, it's almost that unquantifiable thing of everybody working together. You're on a ship, you're all going in the same direction. Yeah. Explain the X down the rabbit hole. If you told that that guy putting the lines down um, that there's a hedgehog in the way, he probably would have wanted to, you know, avoid it. But actually, mm -hmm. is it just selfishness that's the enemy of engagement? That's an interesting question. I think it's down to, sometimes it's lack of awareness more mm. than selfishness. So I think we everybody wants to do a really, really good job and to do the best that they can. And if you don't fully understand the purpose of your organization, you don't really understand what everybody needs to be pulling towards, you do what matters to you. Mm. Um, the, the real trick of engagement is getting people to support each other, to buy into this something bigger than me idea. Mm. So yes, you're right. There is another example, which is even more extreme, of somebody painting around a parked car yeah. um, rather than actually going and getting the person to move the car. But yeah, you're doing the best that you think you should, but engagement is doing it for the bigger picture, for more than just you. There's, there's a lot of psychology in that immediately. You know, we have a one-track mind at certain times and need to get the job done. But actually, what do you see? Are there common patterns that, that you've come across? I think that, I mean, there's a definite, um, if I'm going to a little bit of theory, mm. and I'll try and paint this picture for you because it's hard without being able to see it. Yeah. There's a model, basically, which if you imagine a circle with a horizontal line through that circle, and anything that's the bottom half of that circle has a negative impact. Yeah. Uh, on engagement, anything on the upper half of that circle has a positive impact. So things like feeling appreciated and valued, having good pay, good jobs, all of that kind of thing, that is the bare minimum people expect. So even if you do those brilliantly well and you have the best pay, the best environment, those barely get you to that break-even point. Mm. Um, the things that start to make a real difference are unsurprisingly called drivers. So that's things like having really great leadership, having two-way conversation where you feel like you have a, a say, you have a voice, you're listened to, and being able to get involved with that company and help shape the direction. Mm. And this is the really kind of teetering one where if you do it badly, it can have a really negative impact. But if you do it well, clearly it starts to tip you into that positive half of the circle that we're talking mm. about and then the main ones the ones that are really where our work gets interesting 
is around those accelerators. So the things that sit firmly in the top half, um, if you really want your people to be engaged, the main thing it comes down to is emotion and focusing on emotion, making sure that, you know, if you do a job where your heart really isn't in it, you're not going to do more than the bare minimum. Yeah. If you really are passionate about it, it's something that you love, um, you're going to really put in that discretionary effort and you're going to really deliver. So those are things like, you know, helping to paint that picture. Um, and it's a little bit like a pack mentality, I think. That's mm -hmm. what it really comes down to. I think, you know, it's not just wolves that are pack animals, we are as well. And I think we all want to feel like we're part of that bigger group. So the example, if I can give you an example of what I would uh, use as a good, a good case would be the Olympics. So London 2012, I was working with Transport for London. Um, lots of people saying, oh, you know, because we like to be a little bit negative, this is going to be a disaster. The transport system will never cope. It's going to collapse. It's going to be horrible. But actually, everybody was united behind a single cause with a single objective of making London look really, really, really good and making mm -hmm. the transport look really good. And everybody pulled together because we were united by that one shared objective. Explain the X. Inspiration. What was really interesting about the Olympics in 2012, um, and if you don't remember it, um, there is plenty of video around and lots of other things you can look at. What was really, really interesting was the army of volunteers. So that's, I think, from my point of view, sitting in my armchair going, don't care about it. I couldn't give a stuff about the whole thing. Actually, then you saw the people, you saw the people training, you saw the lines of people training up having fun now. Didn't that change things? Yeah, absolutely. And boy, does it feel a little bit like a distant memory at the moment. Yeah. But it, it, it goes to show, yes, people will do things and, and give this discretionary effort without any reward other than the reward of doing it itself, where we're all united in this weird and wonderful world we're in. How do you keep it going? You can maybe for a fleeting second get people to listen to you and they go, ah, oh, yeah, OK, the newsletter was interesting, right? But yeah. how do you keep that going? Because it very quickly fades. I think that there is a piece for me around obviously relevance of information. So a newsletter, as long as it's relevant, as long as there's something new that you're telling me or something that I need to know to do my job, mm -hmm. I'm going to read it for sure. I think what a lot of companies have done really well, and I've certainly seen it, is having real compassion and empathy for people because we're all going through a different version of this situation for yeah. sure, but we are all going through it. And I think really what we've seen is leaders stepping up and a lot more not face-to-face -face time because we can't be but virtual face-to-face -face time mm. where you're getting to see inside like your ceo's house and things which you know sounds daft but those little things are actually really humanizing people and humanizing our leaders so that you all feel like you actually know them a little bit more explainiacs lessons to learn 87 percent of people aren't engaged at work or even worse they're actively disengaged. When we think about, and it's not a sexy phrase, we think about internal communications, you're thinking about the newsletter, you're thinking maybe about the CEO having a chat with you online. Well, that doesn't even touch the sides in many ways, but yeah. we're talking about what you feel inside, the real internal communications. When you hit that, then it starts to be effective. Totally. And I've always said it as, yes, it is all those tactics you mentioned like newsletters, but actually, it's about people and it's connecting people. The reason I do what I do and why I absolutely love it is because every day I connect people around shared messages, shared ideas, getting people's input, listening, understanding. All of that is communication. It is not just me banging out an email at the end of the day and saying job done. Please provide advice. What's essential right now to take away from the current crisis in terms of the way we get together, pair up, work together better, pull in the same direction. What needs to happen, do you think? I think we've we've really hit on something by the fact that actually we are all in isolation for sure, but we're talking to, to each other far more than ever before. I mean, the number of just, just doing this, for example, you mm. know, we're on a, on a call, we're chatting. Yeah. We are taking the time out because we can't have that physical interaction and, and be together. So we need to maintain that and maintain that closeness and the empathy and the understanding and, you know, taking the time to ask somebody, how are you? And actually meaning it. Explain the acts. Roots to success. Doing things because that's the way it's always been done is a horrible, horrible reason to continue doing anything. Could we build up a little toolkit of methods and approaches? I saw something from Airbnb, from the CEO of Airbnb, which was really detailed. It was breaking difficult news, but it was so detailed, so helpful really genuine because it went into full detail. 
Is that a place to initially go, do you think, Simon? More information? I think more information, yes, but it has to be the right kind of information. Mm. You can have too much. I think definitely showing that the main thing and that Airbnb did really well mm. is to show that you understand your audience. Yeah. So it's not just about putting something out. It's about saying, okay, this is the position. We understand what you're going through. We obviously, And being very realistic about expectation as well. So they do have to think from a company perspective. There are CEOs and directors all over the, the world at the moment thinking, where do we need to go next? How do we start to recover when the time is right? And that's really important that they think about that because they need to. But everybody else is just getting through the day at the moment. So it's having those leaders having awareness that, you know, not everybody's in the same place as them. Um, everyone has their own anxieties and, and struggles and just trying to address them with the facts that they have. You don't have to hypothesize, yeah. actually don't hypothesize, only only say what you know. Be honest about the things you don't know as well. So people are often really reluctant to say, I don't have an answer to that. But you know what? There's nothing more empowering than a leader who just says, I don't know at the moment. I've trained speakers for years and one of the most important things is to tell people when you can't tell them much more. But on top of that, you have to come back and say, but I will be back. I will yes. tell you what I know when I know it. There are just some things that I can't let out into the world yet because they're not confirmed. That's yeah, okay. Exactly. And I think that's that's the real challenge, isn't it? Because everybody wants to give as much as they can and to, yeah. and to say what's happening. And maybe this situation we find ourselves in now with COVID is that there's so much that's unknown that people are having to acknowledge that they don't know. Mm. Um, you can't you can't just make stuff up and say it. So hopefully that will help if that carries forward. This honesty is something that's really key that people really respect clearly. So we've got honesty, which really depends on on the subject matter. You, you know, but you have to start by understanding the concerns, particularly in terms yeah. of the concerns, the fears, the gripes, and going from there. And that will refl- that will be reflected in the content you put out there and the depth of it. That was really important, I think, um, with the Airbnb example, not the length but the depth of it, how actually you answer concerns and went deep enough so that people could actually start to you know, think about what was next. How about the methods? I think there are, there's a very clear thing for me around different channels being good for different things. Um, so, so often people come to you and say, oh, I want to, I want to change people's behavior, send an email. Like, mm-hmm. Well, that's never going to happen. Um, so the face-to-face element actually will probably come back as being even more important than it already is. Mm-hmm. Face-to-face gives you so much more than anything else. You have the body language, you can clearly see the whites of people's eyes, Um, you know, it's easy to pick up on tone, all of those things that even on a video call, you start to lose those things. Mm. So face-to-face is always going to be important. We like to come together. And I think it's going to be a case of actually really listening. This is going to be less about what you tell people and more about what you hear and respond to. Um, So, you know, the phrase that always gets used is active listening. So instead of, you know, you're listening, waiting to say the thing that you've thought of that you want to say next, you're actually listening to what the person's saying. And I think that's what leaders have started to do more of, Mm. and they will need to continue doing that. That, That's going to be way, way more important. So face-to-face will be the way to do that. It Mm. will be the only real way to do that. Explain the X. What do we need to know? So, uh, look, when engagement works, Simon, how do you know it works? You know, is it going to help the business? Does it really? Is it just wishful thinking? Yeah, I think that's a question a lot of people ask uh, because they think engagement and comms is fluffy, but actually it really benefits the bottom line. Um, So there are some great examples. There's been loads of research over the years about how it actually helps. And just to hit you with a few numbers, Mm. um, if you have generally engaged employees, it generates 43% more revenue in your business. Um, If you have employees who are engaged, then those that are are far more likely to recommend the organization they work for than those that aren't. Mm. Um, And actually, they take fewer sick days, um, a third of the number of people who are disengaged. So it really does make a big difference. And actually, what's really interesting to see is if you look at the really world-class, high-performing companies, and we can all think of examples of who they are, then the ratio of engaged to disengaged employees is eight to one. So when you actually look at it, you know, the end result is higher revenue, higher operating margins and higher profits. And I don't know a CEO in the land who doesn't want that. Explain the X. A look to the future. Look, Simon, what about the future? We have uncertain times in the short term ahead. Where is engagement going? I think the the only way is up because you're going to have a situation where we have so many more people wanting to get involved, to have a say. We're seeing this kind of rise of people 
who are coming out talking about if you look at you know environment and, mm. and good old Greta talk, you know getting this mass of people behind her yeah. people are going to want to be sharing their stories to be getting involved with what their businesses are trying to achieve to make sure that actually we come back in the right way and we don't just fall back into the way things have always been done um, which is obviously a risk so i think if we do it in the right way people are going to be even more engaged because they're going to feel a bit more of an ownership and a responsibility for it because we've all gone through this shared experience that now gives us the opportunity to reinvent so i think it will be even more going out listening to people collecting their stories and actually then just sharing them themselves we could end up doing ourselves out of a job to be honest if we do it really really well we probably won't need many internal comms people because the business will just do it and do it really well that's it i quit <laughs> please not yeah exactly <laughs> need a job uh, yeah. no it's wonderful um and final question really do you like hedgehogs? I love hedgehogs. I was traumatized. It's funny, the number of times I've shown the actual picture, um, and it's not too gruesome because obviously you're imagining this in your head, but yeah, it is a bit sad. I love hedgehogs. I feel very, very sorry for it. <laughs> I think that's the most important question of the lot, isn't it? Uh, totally. Well, uh, that is about all we have time for. How was it for you, Simon? That was really good. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, well, now it's time to hear from you at home. Thanks for recommending your own Explainiacs to join our lineup of passionate experts from all walks of life. Lots of great people to come, but I really want to hear from the incredible Explainiacs in your life. People who can explain things that we should all know or would love to know in less than 20 minutes, like no other person on the face of the planet. As always, if it's important, fascinating or fun, we're here to explain it. So get in touch by dropping us a line at explainiacs.com. Okay, I'll be back with another incredible Explainiacs soon. Coming up, we'll be talking about how to educate humans in the AI era, also how to dream up, write and get drama onto the big screen and the small screen too. Okay, see you very soon, stay safe for now and bye bye.